Good afternoon. We are we're we're live. So I've been getting a lot of comments about how none of none of what I'm saying is true because a lot of it hasn't happened yet. But that's not true. We really need to dive in to what the Bible actually says and what prophecy is actually referring to. So I, I, I got some comments on TikTok talking about how the mark of the beast isn't here because the Bible says it's not here, uh, even though the Bible does not say that it's not here. The mark of the beast is here. It's been here. The abomination of desolation is here, and it has been here. So what I really wanted to touch base on tonight was we are living in the time of tribulation. This is the tribulation. You are living in it. We have been living in it since 688 AD. We've been living in it the past 1,300 years. Most people, they believe what most preachers will tell them. They believe the sci-fi stuff that Christians have been force-feeding them for the past 200 years. But just because it's popular and it's a popular belief does not mean that it's the correct belief. You're living in the time of tribulation, and I can prove it. I can prove it with God's timeline, and I can prove it with the Bible and Scripture and what Scripture has to say about the matter. So in reality, we have been in the tribulation. You're going to tell me that World War I, World War II, all the wars that we've been fighting in, hundreds of millions of Christians being killed and executed for their faith, that we're not in the time of the tribulation? Well, let's turn to Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24 talks about that. Matthew chapter 24 tells us about the abomination of desolation. It tells us about the tribulation and the things to come. So in Matthew 24, 15, Jesus says, When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. Whoso readeth, let him understand. Now, I've had a lot of comments that, oh, that's the Antichrist. How did you get that's the Antichrist from that verse? It says, when Ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet stand in the holy place. He's not talking about a him. He's talking about an it. It's an object. And it makes desolate. Because if you go to Daniel chapter 9, 17, Daniel is praying to the Lord, and he says, Now therefore, our God, hear the prayer of your servant and his supplications, and for the Lord's sake cause your face to shine on your sanctuary, which is desolate. So, the Bible's so before before I jump into that, the best commentation on the Bible is the Bible. The Bible gives you the definition of what desolate means. So Daniel's saying that God's sanctuary, his temple, is desolate at that current time. Well, why was it desolate? Because there were no high priest, and the Jews were taken into captivity by Babylon and brought in. To captivity into Babylon. So there was no one there at the temple, the sanctuary, to be conducting sacrifice. So if there was no one there to be conducting sacrifice, it was considered desolate. That's what desolation means. So the abomination of desolation is an object that prohibits the Jews from making their sacrifices. That's the definition. Remember, the best commentation on the Bible is the Bible. So, going back to Matthew. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. 
Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. I, I'm going to read just a few more verses here, but I'm telling you right now, this event has already happened. Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. And woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days. But pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. Well, I've already told you that the abomination of desolation has been here since 688 A.D., but the siege of Jerusalem happened in November of 636 AD. This event has already happened. But most Christians will believe in the sci-fi, Christian sci-fi, the lies that they've been fed for the past 200 years about a pre-tribulation rapture, about uh, some UN antichrist coming from European nations, some antichrist system that, you know, it just does not fit scripture even in the slightest. It, it fits it nowhere. Absolutely nowhere in the Bible. I mean, in Revelation chapter 13, God gives you the location of the beast. And everybody still tells you, oh, well, it's got to be the Holy Roman Empire. It's got to be a European Union. Where are you getting this information? And most of the time, they get their information from Revelation 17 when he says the seven heads are seven mountains. But that is a total mistranslation of what is actually being said there. Because Rome sits on seven hills. There's a lot of cities that sit on seven hills. That's not a very descriptive way to give a location. But God gives a very descriptive location in Revelation 13 and as well as in Daniel chapter 8. He tells you where the beast will come from. But we'll get into that here in a little while. Just so that we can prove that we are in the time of the tribulation. The tribulation's here. Again, it has been here. You're all living in it. So all of this that Jesus just said here already happened. Already happened. For then shall be great tribulation such as not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. He already tells you that after the abomination of desolation stands in the holy place, right, that there's going to be a time of tribulation. Well, you're in it. The abomination of desolation, again, has been here. It's nothing new. But the reason that a lot of people missed it is because... The book of Daniel was sealed for the time of the end. Sealed for the time of the end. So nobody knew it. And he tells us, And except those days should be shortened, there should be no flesh be saved, but for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. And believe me, they have been shortened. And we'll get into that later. But then he goes in and he starts talking about false Christ and false prophets. Well, I think that he's talking about one specific individual. I believe that he's talking about Muhammad. Read, read with me. For there shall arise false Christ. Now, I know Muhammad was a prophet. But. He wasn't just a false prophet. He was also a false messiah because he believes that Christ served him, not the other way around. And shall show great signs and wonders insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. And they did. That's exactly what they did. That's exactly what Islam did to the Christian community. So many Christian people converted to Islam. So many. 
Islam took a foothold in the Middle East when it was predominantly a Christian area before Islam, and they made it Muslim. And Jesus says, Behold, I have told you before, wherefore, if they shall say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert, go not forth. Well, where was Muhammad located? In the desert. It's exactly where he was located. He was located in the desert. Go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers. Believe it not. For as lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. You know, and that's the thing too. They always say, oh, it's a secret rapture. It's a secret second coming. Does that sound like a secret to you? Last time I checked, lightning strikes that go from east to west, it's not a secret. That's a very loud and bright event it's not a secret folks for whosoever for wheresoever the carcass is there will the eagles be gathered together a better translation is not eagles it's vultures right because vultures eat the dead carcasses so the better translation and we can go here and we can look for eagle right Eagle would be a, a better translation would be uh, like a like a vulture. Um, <sighs> as you can see right here that, you know, it may be a vulture that resembles an eagle, but it, it would be a, 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 a vulture. That would be the better translation. Because vultures are the ones that eat dead carcasses. So, and and let's 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 talk about the return of Christ. Okay, let's talk about that for a moment. Because again, most people think like, oh, it's some secret event that happens. There's going to be a rapture, and then seven years of tribulation, and none of that's true. None of that is true. And you can't give me any Bible verse that proves me wrong. There is no Bible verse that you can show me that would say there's a seven-year tribulation. Most people get the seven-year tribulation simply from Daniel chapter 9, the 70 weeks. But the 70 weeks have already been fulfilled, folks. Read Daniel 9 again. The 70 weeks pertains to the Jewish people, to Jerusalem, and to the Messiah, not to some antichrist. And Daniel 9, and I've got it pulled up here, and we'll go to it shortly, but Daniel 9 predicts that, one, the Messiah is to be killed, and we'll get into that, and it predicts the second temple being destroyed, and it gives the reason as to why it will be destroyed. So for anybody who's Jewish who says, well, my Messiah hasn't come yet, well, you better read the book of Daniel because the book of Daniel says that your Messiah has to come before the second temple is destroyed. And the second temple was destroyed in 70 AD. So your Messiah has either already come or the book of Daniel is just a false book. There's no other option. And I don't think the book of Daniel is false in the slightest. I believe that it's true to the fullest extent of God's truth. But let's get into this secret rapture, this secret coming. And why it's wrong. Why it's Christian sci-fi and Hollywood. Matthew 24, 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days. So he's telling you right after the tribulation of those days. And, and, and it doesn't even matter if it's a seven year tribulation or if it's the tribulation that I'm talking about since the beginning of 688 AD. Doesn't matter. It's once the tribulation ends, right after, immediately after the tribulation of those days, shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light. Now, that right there is a conversation on its own. 
that the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of heaven shall be shaken. That's its own teaching. That's its own conversation to be had. And we'll get into that eventually. But he's giving you a timeline. He's telling you right after the tribulation, this, 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 and this is going to happen. And then after those things happen, then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. And they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Does that sound like a secret rapture to you? I mean, he hasn't even gotten to the rapture at this point. But that does not sound like a secret coming. And I don't know about y'all, but I know that Jesus only comes back one other time. He doesn't come back multiple times. He's not a taxi service, folks. He's coming back only one other time. And then verse 31. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. This is the rapture. This is what he's referring to. And they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. That's the rapture. And he put it in chronological order for you. How nice of him. And guess what the last thing was to happen? The rapture. He didn't tell you before the tribulation happens, I'm coming to get you. He says immediately after the tribulation, X, Y, Z, and then after that, X, Y, Z, and after that, you'll see me coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory, and then I will rapture my church, my elect. It's not before. I don't know how you could get before from these three verses. There's no way. Unless you haven't actually read and paid attention to every single word, every single punctuation, and understood what this is saying. This is Jesus telling you, yes, I am coming again, and I will rapture you. But where is this pre-tribulation rapture? And most people, too, they will quote Revelation chapter 3 of the church, right? I will protect you from the hour of trial. Okay? Well, why don't you pick any of the other churches? What about the last church? I will, you know, be hot or cold. If you're lukewarm, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Why aren't you that church? Why are you the one that gets protected? What makes you so special? Are you better than Peter and Paul? Are you better than your Savior? That they got persecuted and martyred and killed for their faith and their belief? Are you better than them? You think you're going to be saved from tribulation and trials? Get off your high horse. You're not better than Paul and you're not better than Peter. None of us are. Their names are etched into the new heaven, onto the gates. My name isn't. What makes me think I'm better than Peter and Paul? The tribulation is here, folks. It's been here. It has been here for a long time. And Jesus' return is imminent. I mean, we can go to the parable of the fig tree. We'll even take a look at Mark 13 and Luke 21 as well. And he says, now learn a parable of the fig tree. Now, most people will tell you that the fig tree is Israel. And I do agree, the fig tree is Israel. But they can't tell you why it's Israel. But we'll get into that later. Because when someone says, well, this is a symbol for something, well, back it up with the Bible. I'd have to find the verse, but it's in the Old Testament where it talks about Israel being a fig tree. So, again, God never took away the symbol that Israel is a fig tree. Never once. Now learn a parable of the fig tree when his branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves, ye know that summer is nigh. 
So likewise, ye, when ye shall see all these things, know that, uh, know that it is near, even at the door. Okay. So we're going to read Matthew here, but then we're going to go to Luke because Luke gives some more explanation as to what the fig tree is and what the parable of that fig tree actually is. Because it's important. Folks, I'm going to tell you right now. I'm going to jump the gun a little bit for you. The time of the Gentile is over. It's been over. And I can prove it through biblical timeline, through scripture, and through secular history that the time of the Gentile is over. And it hasn't been over very long. But let's continue. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Well, all these things have been fulfilled. And I got a year to give you, to tell you that, hey, this year, this specific year, was the end of the reign of the Gentiles. And now it's over. So you only got a generation. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. And of course, Jesus says, But of that day and hour knoweth no man. No, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Now again, I've said it before about some of these verses, but that could be a teaching within its own. Now, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that I know the return of Christ and when he's coming because I don't. I can tell you what day, but not year. I think it's quite obvious if you read scripture. Couldn't tell you what year, but I can tell you what day of the year that he will come. And he, of course, he goes by the, the Hebrew calendar, the Jewish calendar. He doesn't go by our calendar. But it's a feast. It's the Feast of Trumpets. I'll give you that much. And I can explain why, and I can prove it to you scripturally. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. And most people stop right there. They do. They stop right there. And they'll tell you, well, you know, it's just like the days of Noah. You know, everybody's living in sin and debauchery and all. Well, okay, okay, maybe. But let's finish that statement that Jesus is making here. Because I don't really think he's talking about how bad it's going to be. As a matter of fact, it's kind of the opposite. For as the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark. What does that mean? Well, that means that most people are going to continue about their day as if it's another normal day. They're not worried or concerned about the return of Christ. People are going to be doing everyday business activity, business as usual, when Christ returns. Business as usual. That's what it means. That's what he said. And knew not until the flood came and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. That's what he's saying. That's why he says, I'm going to come like a thief in the night. Well, who's he coming for as a thief? Is he coming for the church as a thief? I don't think so. Why would he come for the church as a thief? The church is watchful. The church knows that he's coming. His return is imminent. Now, whether you believe any of this Christian sci-fi uh, Hollywood stuff about the end times, it doesn't matter. I know that you still believe that the second coming is here. The second coming is on its way and that Jesus will reign. I'm just trying to prepare you. For what the Bible actually says and what the Bible actually teaches. But let's go here. Let's let's go to Luke. Let's go to Luke. And he actually said, I, I want to kind of go up here, right here. Because he, he's this is the Olivet Discord. And he is talking 
with the disciples in, in both, right? Matthew gives some information and Luke gives some information. Now, they're both good information and they're not two separate events that he's talking about. You have to merge them together. You have to marry them together and go, okay, Matthew said this and Luke said this. Well, what did they say? Well, let's read. We already read Matthew. Let's read Luke. We'll start in verse 20. And when ye shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that desolation therefore is nigh. So he's telling you when you see armies surround uh, you know uh, uh jerusalem know the desolation is night well that happened already folks the siege of jerusalem it's secular history read about it know about it that's already happened this isn't some distant future event not in this verse it's not now, I do believe that in the future, Israel and Jerusalem will be once again surrounded by armies, but not this verse. This verse already happened. Then let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains, and let them which are in the midst of it depart out, and let not them that are in the countries enter thereinto. Again, this has already happened. For these be the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. So it's something that has to happen so that other prophecies will be fulfilled. And many, many, many prophecies were fulfilled because of this one event. But woe unto them that are with child and to them that give suck in those days for there shall be a uh, there shall be great distress in the land and wrath upon this people and there was folks when islam took over jerusalem they were very brutal to christians and to jewish people period this isn't this isn't some opinion this is a fact you can look into the secular history you need to understand history in order to understand what the Bible is talking about. The Bible predicted it to a T. Jesus prophesied it to a T. Remember, when you see prophecy in, in, in the Bible in any way, shape, or form, know that it's not just prophecy. It's a promise. It's a promise from God. Because God is good. We're not good. We're not deserving of anything that 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 he gives us the only reason we receive anything folks is because he's a good god because he's great that's it it's the only reason there is no other reason so when you read prophecy read it like you're reading a promise because that's exactly what it is and they shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive into all nations. And that's exactly what happened. So this verse, Luke 21, 24, is a parallel prophecy from Revelation 12, verse 6. They're parallel. They're, they're, they're married. They're together. And John tells you how long they shall be led away captive into all nations. He tells you. Tells you exactly how long. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. That already happened, folks. I can prove it through, like I said, the biblical timeline that God gave. And with scripture. That already happened. And we'll get into that. But this is an important verse. Understand this. This is an important verse. Very, very important. Because it gives you the timeline. It gives you the knowledge. On what needs to be done. So, what actually ended up happening is 
the time of the Gentile ended. Okay. And I've been over this before. The time of the Gentile ended in 1967 during the Six Day War when Israel took control of Jerusalem. Period. That's that's a fact. That's what happened. And I can prove it to you. That's the ending of the time of the Gentile. So the time of the Gentile, so that first part of that verse, and they shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive into all nations, okay? That's parallel with Revelation 12, verse 6. Not the second part. The second part is another prophecy. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. That's two prophecies in one verse. Two separate prophecies in one verse. The first part, we can go to Revelation chapter 12. Let's see. We'll go to Revelation. Let's see. Let me go to Revelation 12. And I can prove it. And the woman fled into the wilderness. Well, who's the woman in this chapter? Well, the woman in this chapter is Israel. Where she hath a place prepared of God, that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days. Well, I already told you that the abomination of desolation has been here since 688 AD. That's when they got kicked out. That's when Jesus started his timeline. You read it. He said the you know, when you see the abomination spoken of by prophet Daniel, these things are going to happen. And then in Luke, he says, they will be led into all nations, right? He tells you how long they're going to be gone. 1,203 score days. So 1,260 days. Well, let's do the math. But first, let's back up for just a few seconds here. Ezekiel, we got to go back to Ezekiel because Ezekiel, God says, I have made a day for a year. It's a day for a year prophecy. He never changed that. Just like I was talking about the parable of the fig tree. Well, why is the fig tree Israel? Because God said it was Israel. So God never changed the fig tree. Well, God never changed a day for a year prophecy. So you take 688 AD, and you add 1,260 years, you get 1948. Exactly when Jesus said they would come back. And yes, Jesus did say that. He said that in Revelation chapter 12. Remember, Revelation is not a revelation of John. Okay? Revelation is a revelation of Jesus. Jesus is giving this revelation. John's just writing it down. But he told you, 1948. He said, hey, from 688 AD, you add 1,260 years, Israel will become a nation again. They will be brought back into their land. So what he said, and it happened. So when everybody says, well, the abomination of desolation hasn't happened yet. Yes, it has. Yes, it most certainly has. And he says, and, and of course, he comes back and he's talking about the return of Christ. And he says the same things. But one of my favorite verses here is uh, verse 28. And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads for your redemption draweth nigh. Why? Why is that one of my favorites? Because the majority of this stuff has already happened. It's already happened. And there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and the stars and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the seas and the waves roaring. Now, let's actually stop there for a second. Seas and the waves roaring. Is he actually talking about the seas, the physical ocean? I don't think so. I think he's talking about a multitude of peoples. I think he's talking about people. You go to Revelation, and he says, in the many waters you saw are a multitude of people. Now, there I could be wrong. I mean, that's just my opinion. That's an opinion piece. I will let you know when I give you my opinion and when it's not my opinion. When something is fact, it's fact. When something's opinion, it's opinion. 
Men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. So you're telling me that men's hearts haven't failed them already? You're telling me that, oh, that, that, uh, you know, that hasn't happened yet. Really? How about I hand you a gun and why don't you storm the beach of Normandy? Why don't you stand in Japan and see Hiroshima and Nagasaki? These are World War II references, but you're telling me that people weren't fearing and f their hearts failing because of how scary their time was? And there's other times, too. I mean, let's talk about Vietnam. Let's talk about Afghanistan, Iraq, all these places that have seen war and rumors of war and things that most people would never, ever want to be a part of. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in the cloud, in a cloud with power and great glory. So again, all this happened. The only thing we're, we're doing now is uh, verse 28. Look up, because your redemption draweth nigh. And of course, he gives them the parable of the fig tree. This generation shall not pass away till all be fulfilled. There's only a few things left that need to be fulfilled, folks. And that's like, I mean, the end. The, the very end. There's not much else. But we can go into... Give me one second here. We can go into Daniel 9 and talk about the 70-week prophecy. That it's already happened it's already happened the, the the prophecy has already been fulfilled right so let's let's start in verse 24 70 weeks i'm in the new king james i, I i'm not a fan of the king james new king james i'm sorry i'm a fan of the king james and and, and that's and, and that's just that's just me folks that's it really doesn't matter which translation you use. Oh, I spelled Daniel wrong. That's nice. Yeah, Daniel. Man. Daniel 9. Okay. King James. Perfect. Okay. So, let's start in verse 24. Okay? Now, we have to understand that, again, the 70 weeks has already happened. 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and thy holy city... Okay, so for the Jewish people and for Jerusalem, okay, and it gives the reason why to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. I didn't read anything about the Antichrist there, did you? I didn't read anything about the end times there, did you? 70 weeks already happened, folks. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment, so when do we start? Well, we start in King Cyrus's third year in power, when he gave the commandment for the Jewish people to go back from Babylon to Judea. That's when the timeline starts. And remember, a day for a year prophecy, 70 weeks, 490 years, okay? So that's when the commandment started, the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem. That's when this timeline started. Unto the Messiah, the Prince, shall be seven weeks. So he's saying, it shall take 49 weeks to rebuild the temple and to rebuild Jerusalem. That's what he says. He says, 49 years, seven weeks, and three score and two weeks. So after the seven weeks starts the 62 weeks, okay? I lost my spot here. And three score in two weeks, the streets shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. And there was trouble. There was definitely trouble. Read Ezra. Read Nehemiah. When they were rebuilding Jerusalem, there was most certainly trouble. And there was trouble after as well. I mean, I don't know if you know this, but secular history states that Rome did take over Jerusalem. 
There was troublous times. And after three score in two weeks, shall Messiah be shall Messiah be cut off? Well, a Jewish idiom is to be cut off. To be cut off means to be killed, executed. That's what it means. So Daniel's telling you right here that after three score and two weeks, so after the 62 weeks, the Messiah shall be cut off. Now, did he say immediately after the 62 weeks? No. It's not what he said. He said after the 62 weeks. So if you take the 62 weeks, you add the seven, you get the 69 weeks. That's when your Messiah is going to be born. But then he's saying after that 62 weeks, the Messiah is going to be cut off. So after the 62 weeks is done, Messiah is going to die. Okay, and he says, but not for himself, because we know that Jesus didn't die for himself, it wasn't for fun. He died for us while we were still yet sinners, while we were still yet horrible, despicable people. He died for us because that's how much God loves us. And the people of the prince. Now, notice how this word prince is not capitalized. Notice how this one is capitalized. Because this is a different prince. This is not the Messiah, the prince. Pay attention to every word, folks. Every little detail you can about scripture. And you'll learn something. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. So he's telling you that after Messiah's death, there's going to come a prince that shall come and shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with the flood. There's that word flood again, or water, many peoples. And unto the end of the war, desolations are determined. Well, we saw that in Daniel 17, he said, Your sanctuary, O Lord, is desolations. But why is it desolations? Because there was no sacrifice happening, folks. So when the city is destroyed and the temple is destroyed, you're not going to have any sacrifice anymore. And let's go to verse 27. This is one of the most important verses here in Daniel. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. Who's he? Who's he? Well, we're talking about the Messiah. I know that we were talking about the prince here and right here, but that's it. That, that's the only statement we have from this prince, which was Titus, by the way. They were the ones that destroyed the holy city. And the sanctuary. And as a matter of fact, it wasn't even actual Roman people. It was, just, it was people from Syria that they hired. They hired mercenaries to come and destroy the temple. It's basic history. Look it up. So right here, and he is referring to the Messiah. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. Well, what covenant did he make? Well, Jesus made a covenant. He made a covenant with many when he died. But it's a one-week covenant. Well, when does that one week start? Well, let's start at the baptism of Jesus when Jesus starts his ministry. Jesus gets baptized three and a half years later in the midst of the week. Three and a half years, three and a half days, right? In the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. Well, when Jesus died and was crucified, what do you think he did? He ended the sacrifice. That's what he did, folks. He ended the sacrifice when he was the sacrifice. So in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. And then, of course, where's the other three and a half? The other three and a half weeks, the other three and a half ye years, right? The other three and a half days. Where is that? Well, after Jesus died, three and a half years later, Stephen is killed. He's stoned to death. Three and a half years after Jesus' death, Paul starts his ministry to the Gentiles. He made a covenant with many for one week, and they rejected him. And it says right here, he, he caused the uh, sacrifice and the oblation to cease. And now he's going to give his reason 
God gives his reason as to why he will make the temple desolate. And for the overspreading of abominations. So abominations are happening in his sanctuary. He shall make it desolate, even until the consumption or the completion, and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. Because of the overspreading of abominations, God made the temple and sanctuary desolate. I mean, don't take my word for it. Read the, read the scripture. Read the verses. God made the sanctuary a desolate place. That's exactly what he did. That's exactly what he said he would do. Sorry for coughing so much. I'm still kind of getting over uh, uh, a sickness. But this already happened, folks. The 70 weeks has already been fulfilled. Already been fulfilled. So where is the seven-year tribulation that you talk about? Because most people get the seven-year tribulation from right here. That, that's, where, that's where they get it. That's where they get it. But that's, that's about Jesus. It's not about the Antichrist. And we'll get into the whole Antichrist scenario later. We can talk about that eventually. There's a lot that we could talk about. There's a lot that we can understand. But folks, the majority of this stuff has already happened. Our goal right now is to witness to people. Is to understand that Christ's return is imminent. That he's coming again soon. Our job as Christians is to go into all the world and preaching the gospel and baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Folks, don't be sucked into this fake gospel of God, you know, the prosperity gospel and, and you know, any other false gospel that can't be backed up by Scripture. I've seen so many preachers talk about, well, you know, the Lord wants you to be rich. The Lord wants you to do this or this. Let me tell you something. My Jesus was a poor Jewish man from the Middle East who bled and died for me. My Jesus probably didn't smell all too great. Probably didn't have the opportunity to bathe as often as we do in today's time. My Jesus probably wasn't very groomed. Jesus doesn't care how much money you have, what status you are in life. My Jesus cares about what's in your heart. Folks, if you're a Christian, you need to go out there and witness to your family. Everybody needs to take a piece of the pie. If you're not on your hands and knees praying every day for your lost family members and friends, and you're no family member or friend. Because the end is near. And your redemption draweth nigh. But that's your redemption. Is that your friends and family's redemption? Go out there. Preach the gospel. Be unashamed of it. Don't worry about any of this woke political stuff that's going on in the, in the corporate side of, of, of America. Oh, I don't want to be fired. I don't want to be this. You let God worry about that. There's enough to worry about. But folks, I, I appreciate y'all coming here. I appreciate y'all listening to me and, and letting me teach you about God's timeline and his prophecies and what's already been fulfilled. And I know that it goes against a lot of what most people teach nowadays. But I feel that I can back it up with Scripture. And I can back it up with God's timeline. And that's not because of me. That's because of God. 
But again, go out and witness. Go out and love one another. I, I, we, I'm going to be doing more teachings, not just on the end times, uh, other teachings as well. I'm going to be doing other videos. And usually this isn't my demeanor, but I feel like this has to get out there. You have to understand what's going on. But I, I again, I appreciate y'all being here. Y'all have a wonderful rest of y'all's evening.